Okay, so um, we we volunteered to go last in part because we were willing to flex, but it's really great that we did because we're going to be talking a little bit about something that's running in parallel with what um, Alicia was talking about, but is is somewhat similar, and uh, that is sort of how do you build a course around emerging technologies? In this case, our um, AR VR, so augmented and virtual reality, and why would you build a class around? Um, emerging technologies. So this is the class. Uh, we just finished it. It was taught this past spring. Um, and the title is Exploring Museum Applications of Augmented and Virtual Reality. It is a Praxis Independent Study Fieldwork Seminar. We will explain what that means. <laughs> um, but we had six students, um, very heavily leaned towards um, uh, computer science students, however, being Bryn Mawr students and Haverford students, they all had something besides computer science that they were doing, right? So, um, and that was cities, we had some... Science, cities, political, math as well. Yeah, math, political science. So a, a pretty good, good mixture. None of them, interestingly, uh, museum studies students. We have a museum studies program. Um, uh, so that part of it was a little bit new for them. And the idea really was um, to look at, so, Augmented and virtual reality, you know, the question for me as an educational technologist is typically when I'm helping faculty integrate technology into their teaching, it's off the shelf kinds of things, right? Things that have been around for a while, it's things like PowerPoint, it's things like um, maybe uh, using um, an online web conferencing program or something like that, right? This is not off the shelf. This stuff is like really just out there, people are still developing for it, there's no idea what it's going to do. Um, there's the sense that it will be what the, it is now what the iPhone was maybe 10 years ago, right? Um, so this is what our students will be working with. And so this is where sort of educational institutions are grappling with this. What do we do with this thing, right? It's not really there yet. Um, museums are actually grappling with this as well. And one of the things that I found very interesting was the kinds of questions we're having about what, you know, how do we, what's our responsibility? We don't have expertise in this, right? These are things that museums are also grappling with. So it was a really nice way of um, getting students to think about sort of the implications of a technology, how a technology fits into a culture, right? Uh, we talked to some practitioners in museums, the sort of tech people and the museum people think very differently and how they had to get, come together to talk about conferences. So it, it really, um, was a really nice sort of intellectual space for them to be in. And then also um, the idea behind a praxis course, as we will talk about in a minute, is that you're not only uh, learning, you're learning by doing, you're learning by experiencing, right? So it's not just that you are actually reading about these things or maybe hearing guest lectures, but you're also gonna try something, right? And in this case, the trying was developing an AR, VR app or installation or exhibition of some kind that was related to this. So uh, our students just finished a couple weeks ago presenting their projects. So we had three teams. Uh, one was Twitter Vision, which was sort of an augmented reality goggles. So imagine you have these goggles on and it's superimposing Twitter um, messages with certain hashtags in front of you and you can move them around and man manipulate them. Um, the other one was Data Vision, talking about um, visualizing different data but in 3D all around you. So again, with this sort of goggles that superimpose the, the virtual on top of the world around you. And then the last room, Block Room, is an app, an OS app for Google Cardboard. So if you put it on your phone and then put your phone into a Google Cardboard, which is about 15 bucks, you sort of can see this little game that they created. You can actually download this, probably using this URL, or this QR code, um, if you want. So where did this come from, the idea of a course? One thing that was really interesting, Pollock and I were, um, we had been, and we'll sort of show you the history of how we got involved with these devices, but we had been playing around with the augmented virtual reality thing, and we saw this, this webinar on AR, VR for experiential learning, and we were like, great, this is exactly what we want to do, you know, we get in. And what they meant by this was programmers and subject area experts creating these simulations like a simulated lab or a simulated environment that students could have a field trip in for the students to experience. 
which is great and it's important and the work that they're doing is really interesting, but we don't want our students to just be sort of passive consumers of technology. We also want them to be critical makers and developers of technologies and this comes into something that Alicia alluded to which is our digital competencies program which is really about sort of how do we help students reflect on how they're using technology think about that um, to build their skills but also articulate what it is that they've learned and it really is not just the skills themselves but also how technology impacts the way we do things the way we generate knowledge the way we communicate so the, the question that Pollock and I had been asking was, can we create an experiential learning experience around having students develop right, for AR, VR? And again, I believe very strongly that this is the technology that's going to be, that they're going to be working with when they get out into the world in their career lives. So you know, having a little bit of experience with it, knowing what it is, is, is really important. Some concerns. Um, this is you can picture Pollock saying these things to me. But Jenny, but Jenny, we don't have any technical expertise. I've said this multiple times. But Jenny, you know. So and just we'll leave you with these, and we'll sort of explain uh, where we went with that in a minute. But we were worried, or Pollock was worried. Yeah. So why experiential learning? Um, there's a huge body of research out there showing that it engages students, again, the, the new you know, uh, but also that it supports retention, persistence, and it, also that it improves learning outcomes, both sort of disciplinary outcomes and the kind of critical skills thinking type things. Um, and it is just, for example, the basis of half of the, if you're familiar with Ku's high impact practices, right, experiential learning is sort of five out of ten <coughs> there. So um, just to give you all a bit of context about what we've developed and what we've done with our students, um, we got these HoloLenses, I think, in August 2016. So we've had them for a few, almost a year and a half, two years now. Um, and based on student interest, we had done sort of workshops and sort of informal focus groups with faculty and staff and students across campus. Based on that, students said, hey, can we do something more with this? Can we try and learn how to create things for this. And with that, we actually ended up creating a um, three week long winter uh, internship for four students. Um, and in three weeks, um, they were actually able to create um, what you're seeing here, which is called Hollow Music. Um, it's essentially, a it's a storyboard that is what they created for a um, virtual, um, basically a virtual orchestra learning experience where you could sort of go through it and learn about different instruments that get involved. Um, uh, in, that get utilized in orchestra. Um, based on that, we actually had two students who were both rising sophomores at the time um, join us for a summer, uh, a 10 week long summer internship. And in 10 weeks, they actually made Polo Museum, which essentially lets you um, put on this pair of goggles um, and walk around the statues of Athena as if you were staring like, right at them in person in real life without the hindrance of a glass barrier or, you know, the fear of destroying thousands of years of history in front of you. Um, so they actually were able to develop that. Um, we also had another student in our fall 2017 um, internship um, develop a physics app that looks at the, explaining the ideas of electromagnetism, which, you know, that idea already flies over my head, but this actually made it tangible and accessible. Um, so if you notice, um, one of the things that we have we had in these internships was that we only had about two, four, Two, uh, four students, two students, and one student. So we had a lot, a uh, very low number of students um, that were able to engage in this technology over a long period of time, which led us to, you know, do this experience where we actually had six students um, joining us as part of this, this practice course, so that they could actually get the experience um, in a control. In a, controlled is a loose term, but in a setting in which um, they would actually be able to work collaboratively and work together to actually develop different technologies. You can come on in. <laughs> So, and so, and one of the things that we discovered when we, and so our internships are run very much as um, Alicia runs her fellowships and that they have a lot of control over what, you know, they have, we worked with them to sort of scope out what their project ideas were, what they wanted to do. They did a lot of the learning unity um, to figure out um, what needed to happen. This was where I said, but Paula, we'll learn with them. <laughs> and actually, I think really they probably learned more than we did. Um, so it's really the students figuring out how to do these things on their own. We can certainly help. We've seen some of the problems that have come up. We've been able to warn them 
you know, make a port to your device quickly because that's going to be one of the hardest things. But we are certainly not experts, nor did we actually need to be. And one of the nice things about, I think, emerging technologies is the students very quickly discover that no one is an expert. And so they're actually talking to folks at Microsoft, they're talking to the sort of HoloLens development community to solve problems that everybody's having because it's wonky. Um, So we wanted to talk a little bit about why did we go from um, the internship model to the Praxis course. And Pollock hinted at one of the things, and that was really time. So we had um, four students that could commit to doing a winter break type thing. Not everybody could do that. We had, um, we, had to, we actually wanted to have more students over the summer. We had the problem that students had a bunch of different sorts of opportunities over the summer. Not everyone can afford to stay on campus. Not everyone um, can do an internship. Um, similarly, when we tried to do internships during the year, it's really hard for them to balance that with their course load. And it's also hard for us to manage that with course consultations that we might be having. So you know, the amount of time that we may have been able to spend in the summer is a little bit reduced um, during the school year as well. Mm -hmm. so, so we actually had a student who had signed on to do a summer internship who then got another summer internship offer and chose to go that direction because it really made the most sense for that student. And that student then came to um, the Praxis office, which is where I work, and said, I'd really like to turn this experience that I could have done this summer into an independent study course for the fall semester and work with Jenny and Pollock to do this. And so we started exploring what that could mean. Um, and initially, it really was going to mean a single course. Um, my office or program, the Praxis program, is the community-based learning program on campus. The next slide is actually going to tell you more about that, but I was kind of not sure how best to introduce this information. So I'll start with what we, the umbrella that we fall under. So Praxis is part of the Civic Engagement Office, which is part of the Leadership, Innovation, and Liberal Arts Center. It's a virtual center as such. We have offices all over campus. Um, but the, the core pieces are the Career and Professional Development Office and Civic Engagement. And then we house all other kinds of um, experiential learning opportunities from intensives to work with alums. Um, we also work with a set of broad-based competencies for professional development and behavioral. Um, so we tie very neatly um, with our LITS counterparts with the digital competencies. So that's why I provided this in part because it shows you a little picture of who all participates in LILAC and then some of the competencies that we work on. Praxis, as the community-based learning program um, on the campus, is really the only way that students during the academic year can get credit for um, a course that has field work in it. So, we don't, at Bryn Mawr, our students do not receive credit for internships or field work alone. It's a course that they're working on. And so there are three levels of Praxis. Praxis one and two courses are lower level engagements in the field, generally tied to a certain number of hours, two to six, over the course of a semester, and they're part of a departmental course that meets regularly once or twice a week. And then we have what this student was seeking, which was the Praxis Independent Study, or the, now we also have these Praxis We've changed it since Jenny would have written this, the Praxis Seminar courses. Um, and these are courses where either we have a single student, a faculty advisor, and a field work component come together to designed by the student um, over the course of a semester where they spend eight to 10 hours a week in the field, and then they, they meet regularly with a faculty advisor, one of whom is sitting in this room. And, um, or we have a group of students in field sites um, that are similar to each other or have similar, um, are confronting similar issues or topics. And then those students meet together in a seminar format with a single faculty advisor and um, address the material over the course of a semester with core academic content. So Pollock and Jenny made this a Praxis seminar course. And that's how we got to be able to turn it into a course and incorporate more students. The student who had decided to do a fall independent study, ended up just doing it as a fall internship because she ended up not needing the course credit. But, um, but that's how we got where we are. You can tell our students drive a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> and I would say that there are, um, excuse, yes, so what about those worries? Um, and so, you know, thinking about the pros and cons of this, one, though we don't have enough expertise, we don't have the funding equipment. 
Um, we actually discovered that the technical expertise, again, we've been able to learn along with the students. Um, nobody has the technical expertise, so we're learning, you know, everyone in the world is learning right along with them, which I think can be a very powerful um, experience for them. The funding equipment, we could have gone really crazy and bought like all of these, you know, um, the, the devices that you plug into a high powered computer and stuff like this, but when we turned it to the sort of ed educational technology or looking at it from the sort of Howard Museums and cultural institutions using this, they also are faced with this sort of cost benefit analysis. And so looking for cheap ways to do this was actually um, relatively useful and, and really um, useful for them, for them to think about what are sort of the trade-offs, right? Can um, we had, uh, we made some great connections with the Franklin Institute, for example, and they've thought a lot about how they want to do augmented and virtual reality. They are a science museum. They believe very strongly that they have a role in making sure that um, a wide range of people has access to this technology. And so thinking about that, thinking about who gets to play with AR, VR, right? Is it just because you belong to this fancy school? Is it just because, you know, um, you, do we want to put devices in the hands of everyone? Do we want to um, use something that they couldn't go off and develop for? Um, the kids that did Block Room, they can download the app to their parents' phones, get a, for, a $14, $15 Google Cardboard, and their parents can see it. The kids who did HoloLens, you know, without that HoloLens device, which costs like $3,000, $5,000, no one else can see it, right? So they did actually video of their project, so you can kind of get a sense of what it was like. But, um, so we had to talk through all of these things, right? And they talk through all of these things, and they talk through all of these things with um, museum professionals. Um, another worry that comes up around somewhat the internships, but more maybe when you're taking this into the course realm, is, is, is this vocational training. Uh, should we be doing this at a liberal arts college, right? Is this the kind of thing that we really want to get into? Um, we have our, our, our definite sort of thinking about that, but we might open that up to you. Um, another is, st should students receive academic credit for this kind of thing, right? There's the, the, in the Praxis model, there is a sort of academic course that is built around this. Um, the students have readings, you know, we have theoretical discussions, we have sort of when we apply theory to particular ideas. Um, but is, is that a good thing? Is that um, a not good thing? I think there are also maybe institutional sort of questions around here, again, around who gets to take a Praxis course, you know, who gets to take a course, who gets to do an internship, who gets to um, uh, sort of what, what opportunities are closed out to different people because of the choices that we make about how we do this. Um, so we'll leave you guys with those questions. I don't know if they've been answered. And then we can take questions for everybody now.